Are the God Culture, a group of independent researchers with no affiliation to any denomination or organization whatsoever. We read the word and we test it as 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. We do not intend to be confrontational, but to compare what the Bible really says versus the traditions of men, which Jesus himself rebuked. Jesus said to the Pharisees, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Mark 7, 9. This is our journey through the Word, and we are restoring the name of God in our worship. Okay, back to it. Let's explore the roots of these names. Yeshua, Yahshua, Yehoshua, Joshua. Are they valid? Either of them. Are they maybe derivatives or shortened names, perhaps? We do not believe so, especially since Yeshua, the most popular, has three syllables just as Yahushua does. So, no, it's not shorter than the other, uh, except if you want to say one letter shorter, but that doesn't matter. We're talking about sound here. But it is, it has a definitive traceable origin. By the way, when you see other names in the Bible spelled other ways, they are not the same name as Yahusha. Just because some guy was named something close does not mean you then take that name and assume every variant that looks close is the name of the Messiah. That is nonsense. We do not agree with that. For a quick visual review, his Hebrew name, which is his original name, not Greek, is Yahusha. And it can also be pronounced Yahushua. But why choose the longer name when one does not need to? Again, not putting anyone down as those folks are not wrong, just long. Sorry, there's that bad pun again. So let's enter Scholarland. Woohoo! And see how this somehow gets justified as being Jesus? Yeah, this is a logic, all right. One of the scholars from hermeneutics.com. Yeah, we won't comment on the fact that. Hermes was a false god, but never mind. Offers this explanation. Sorry if it makes your head spin, but we have to cover this. Perhaps hold on to something if you need to. It starts with Jehoshua, as if that's the origin of Joshua's name. But we already showed you that's very wrong. So, from the foundation, this is complete nonsense. Don't blame this guy, though. He's just doing his job. This is how they train us in seminary. Worse, we actually bought this crap, too, for many years, but not anymore. So, he starts with J. The Hebrew Yod becomes the Greek Lata, or Ayata, sorry, except he didn't do his research at all, and we didn't ev either back then, so we're not blaming him. There is no J in ancient Greek, so anything starting with a J should be thrown out from the beginning, done. Nothing else left to discuss. This is obviously just a political line, but doubtful this scholar even knows that. We didn't either. Again, I would be the acceptable J not. Let's move on. E. Where did that sound come from? The same sound is found in both. Well, yeah, but where did the E come from? Because it's ah, it's ya, yeah, it's y a h. Okay. H. Greek has no st standalone letter for H. So they had to drop this letter. Ah, uh, wait. Okay, perhaps. But they still have an ah uh, sound. But that would require the A, not E. 
That's the real problem here. Back to it. O. Without an H to connect to, the O disappears. Wow, magic. Combining the E and the O would produce an unnatural sound in Greek. They don't have that diphthong. Okay, except they do have a U, and it's a U, not an O, by precedence, right? So again, nothing there. Then SH, the Hebrew shin, long E sound, is SH together and becomes a sigma, merely an S, as Greek does not have a letter for the SH sound. That makes sense and true. Fair. First one. U, equivalent sounds in both languages. Should have remembered that when you tried to render an O when it's a U perhaps in the middle of the word. And A, Greek prefers not to end a name with a vowel sound, so they often, but not always, add a sigma. Funny because we showed you the name of Joshua from the Septuagint, and it ends with a vowel. So, ancient Greek really did not have an issue with that. Did it not like it? Ah, perhaps he's probably right about that. He probably knows better than we do. But certainly, that precedent is not that well established. So, what do we learn from this? Absolutely nothing. But I think I'm getting a headache because it begins with a faulty foundation on sinking sand. And building a house from there is a waste of time. Because you'll never have a good foundation. And this is what scholars do with justifying Jesus. I'm sorry, but it, it just cannot work out. It doesn't even remotely work out. You have to find its origin. And the origin of this name is Hebrew, not Greek. So you've got to start there. For Pastor Stephen Anderson to take off and go on and on and on and on from the Greek, it's just nonsense to start there because this is a word of Hebrew origin. And we've proven that. That is not a matter that you can debate. You can't. It is Hebrew. So trying to justify how anyone gets from a transliteration of a transliteration is always going to lead to a Roger Rabbit, Bugs Bunny moment. You can't move forward in logic when there is no J in ancient Greek nor Hebrew to start. You can't even get past the first letter. It will never work. There is no logical way to get to Jesus. They just did it. And it has no definition, losing its meaning, which when restored is Yah or Yahoo is salvation. Now that is a no-brainer. No, the guy in black was not the professor, by the way. We're not picking on this guy. We're using his, his comment, but he's saying the same thing you're going to hear from tons and tons of scholars who don't do their homework. They don't check these things out. They don't question what they're taught. They just buy it. And many times, far too many times, it's wrong, and we've proven it wrong many times just on this channel alone, just this one little small group. So he's just trying to do his job. He's handicapped in a false paradigm of scholarship, which is our one of our largest concerns in the church today. But let's take a look at some other names that are propagated as his original Hebrew name or a shortened version of it, and this... This will probably shock you. This is actually an article on Bible-History.com. Imagine this. They put up this supposed picture, which is not a picture but a computer-generated image, meant to look as if it is somehow archaeology. <laughs> but it's not. And, it's, and they say, this is how the name Jesus would have been written in ancient 
Hebrew documents. So let me get this straight. This computer-generated image is how the name of Messiah would have appeared if, in fact, anyone actually wrote or pronounced it that way. Hmm. I see. The four letters or consonants from right to left are Yod, Shin, Vav, Ayin. Y-S-H-O-A. This is the name Yeshua. But it's not a name recorded in Scripture for Joshua nor Jesus, as they pretty much admit so. It's impertinent and in no way connected. See the missing letters? Just the very name of God. That's all. They just took out the Yahoo. Well, who needs that? We can just throw that part out, right? Uh, That's the only part you can't throw out. The others are there, but who would want to remove the name of Yahuwah, or Yahu, from the Messiah's name? We are going to read this as copied directly from safaria.org, a Kabbalistic Jewish site. These are the words from Gitan 57a, 3 and 4, in the next slide, in the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud. We have added nothing to this, just highlighted the name Jesus. That's it. We look at this Talmudic name in Hebrew as well, coming up. The story begins, and this is, is not on the slide. The Jumara relates Onkelis Bar Kalanikos, the son of Titus' sister, wanted to convert to Judaism. We didn't put that on the screen, but that's the background. Onkelis then went and raised Jesus the Nazarene from the grave through necromancy. Very nice. Onkelis said to him, Who is most important in that world where you are now? Wait till you find out where that is. Jesus said to him, No, he didn't, but we'll read it. The Jewish people. Onkelis asked him, Should I then attach myself to them in this world? Jesus said to him, Their welfare you shall seek, their misfortune you shall not seek. For anyone who touches them is regarded as if he were touching the apple of his eye. See Zechariah 2.12. Let's keep reading. Onkelis said to him, What is the punishment of that man? A euphemism for Jesus himself. Again, not our words. Theirs. In the next world. Jesus said to him, He is punished with boiling excrement. As the master said, Anyone who mocks the words of the sages, don't remember that scripture, will be sentenced to boiling excrement. Definitely don't remember that scripture. I guess we missed that one. No, we didn't. And this was his sin, as he mocked the words of the sages who... They're talking about Jesus, Yahusha. The Jamara comments, Come and see the difference between the sinners of Israel and the prophets of the nations of the world. As Balaam, who was a prophet, wished Israel harm. Whereas Jesus the Nazarene, who was an Jewish sinner, ugh, sought their well-being. Hmm. Okay, you will notice this is framed, really, as worship of the Jewish people, largely. Not by the average Jew. They didn't write this stuff. They don't write this kind of stuff. This is the Pharisees who wrote the Babylonian and Jerusalem Talmud. What is Jesus' punishment for mocking the words of the sages? Yeah, we're going to use that name on this slide. Because this is profanity, really. Um, Boiling in excrement? Really? We didn't make that up. It clearly says, Jesus, 
doesn't it? That's not our word. In fact, we don't really even use that name. We added nothing. So, what is the Hebrew name for Jesus, Yahusha, but in the Talmud? We looked for it in the Hebrew of this passage, and we didn't find it for some reason. We thought we did. We picked out a word that was closest, and it turns out we were wrong. And we actually had a viewer point this out. Thank you for that. Thank you very much for that, because we want to be accurate. And that's why this video has been re-uploaded for that purpose, because we thought we found that word in the passage and it wasn't the right word. The reason, it's not there. Why? Because they obscure the name. And we'll show you why, but wait till you see where this leads. Thank you again to that viewer. The Talmud renders the name of Jesus. Yahusha is the accurate name. We know that. But it renders it as Yeshu. This is the root of Yeshua. Or you could say the other way around. In either case, the two are invariably linked it is known by several sources we reviewed, but we'll simply cite Wikipedia, because that's easy to find, and it is sourced, so it is a fair way to use Wikipedia. We always check to see if it's sourced, and we check those sources as well, but we want to make the information easy for you to find and confirm. So, this claims that this is an acrostic, a shortened form of a name. This modern Hebrew name, which means, ah, uh, may his name be obliterated. Are you kidding? Wow. Well, isn't that lovely? A curse placed after the name of particular enemies of the Jewish people. A variant is... Yamak Shemo Vizikro. We murdered that, I'm sure. Again, we're not linguists. We're not trying to be linguists, but we can research and we can find things and we can compare and match and make sure that we're being told accurate information. And we are not. Not even in the church, unfortunately. And even the Messianic community, unfortunately. Obliterate his name and his memory. Yamak Shemo is one of the strongest curses in the Hebrew language. Whoa. So, do you still wonder why we don't use this term? Or Yeshua? Either way. During the post-biblical period, the further shortened form, Yeshu, was adopted by Hebrew-speaking Jews to refer to the Christian Jesus. However, Yehoshua continued to be used for the other figures called Jesus, which, of course, is wrong and deceptive. Now, we'll break that down a little bit further as well. But you can see the agenda behind this change, and you can see the leaven of the Pharisees. It's plain and clear. So, how can we say this is the origin of the name Yeshua or Yeshua? Well, first, Scripture never says his name is Yeshua or Yeshu, either one. We showed you that it's Yahusha, and that is very difficult to dispute because the name of the Father is right there in his name. And if you take that out, it's not good. Eisenmenger, a Jewish scholar about 30 or so years ago, claimed that Jews believed that they were forbidden to mention names of false gods and instead were commanded to change and defame them and did so with Jesus' name, as they considered him a false god. He argued that Jesus' original name was Yeshua. Okay. 
And as Jews did not recognize him as Savior, Moshiach, or Moshiach, really, or that he had even saved Hoshia himself, they left out the ayin from the root meaning to save. Interesting. They removed the salvation part. Hmm. These two words are the same, and neither are shortened versions of Yahusha. They removed the name of Yahuwah God and the salvation message from Yahusha. Indeed, wrong. Because now the meaning Yah is salvation doesn't exist. And you have a word that does not mean that, no matter what they try to tell you in a dictionary written by Pharisees. Of course, some Pharisees like to argue this case, but the same will argue the Pharisees had nothing to do with crucifying Yahusha. Yet, their own Talmud says they did, and so does the Bible. This is a standard tactic to even deny something that is right there in black and white because you and I are goyim, and deceiving us is one of the missions laid out in the Talmud, even, if you read it. So, no, we cannot trust these guys with Scripture, nor even Hebrew. Yahusha, Yah is salvation, and it has Yahu in his name, but Yeshu removes the name Yahu, the Ahu, the name of Yahuwah, and it omits the Wa, the U, altogether. So it's not the same word, nor a derivative in any way of Yahusha. And as you saw, it is the root invariably connected to Yeshua. Whether one came first or the other came first, the two are linked together. Even if we give the Pharisees the benefit of the doubt and say that the Jewish scholar Eisenmenger is wrong, which is not likely, this name does not mean Yah is salvation, no matter how you look at it, because Yah is not in the name, and they also removed the salvation part. His name isn't yes, is it? So this doesn't work. What's missing in Yeshua? It removes Yahu, or at least Ahu, the name of God. It omits the Wa in the middle completely, which is a U in this case, which you can't ignore and you can't say that it's right under any circumstance. The ending could be okay, but the rest, no. And the meaning, ugh. This is why we do not use this name. I know you can look it up in most any dictionary and it will define it in the same as Yahusha. Yah is salvation, but they removed Yah. So how can they say Yah is in the word when they removed it? And how is Y-E-H ever short for Y-A-H or a replacement for? Not ever. It doesn't work. Who do you think controls those dictionaries? Well, the very same people that wrote what we just read from the Talmud. It's the same organization and always has been. We showed you the origin of this word. It's up to you to test this and prove it out for yourself and see what you think. Some say, well, it could be spelled Yahshua. And again, it gets close, but why be close? Why not get it right? It's missing the Wa or you from the Father's name. So again, it is scrubbing, erasing part of the Father's name that is there and should be there. That's no small thing. What about Yahashua? Again, it removes the name of God, Yahoo, and replaces it with E and O, which have no precedent 
in this name. His name was never Joshua or Jehoshua. It was and is and always will be Yahusha. All of these counterfeits remove the name of Yahuwah from the name of Messiah, and that is no accident. Why? Acts 4.12 Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Are we saying you cannot be saved in Jesus' name? No, we have never said nor alluded to that. But it is important we realize this name matters. It is the name above all names. Yahusha is the name above all names. Yahusha saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is no other name, no other way. And now that we know his real name, as we progress in relationship with him, may we all restore his name in our worship. Luke ten seventeen. because there is power in his name, can we not cast demons out in Jesus' name? Of course we can, but how much more with his real name restored, Yahusha. And the seventy returned again, these are the disciples that he sent out, with joy, saying, Lord, Yahusha, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And then he says, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Yahusha. He has a name. Why not use it rather than a transliteration of a transliteration using modern forms of two languages, which didn't even have a J until the 1500s or so? Romans 10.13 for whosoever shall call upon the name of Yahusha shall be saved. And that's greater than any miracle, by the way. 1 Corinthians 6.11 And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Yahusha and by the Spirit of our God. Most of us know the standard salvation scriptures we are taught, and you do not hear them on this channel often. Do you know why? Because we do not ignore Yahusha's definition of salvation. We don't follow the Billy Graham doctrine and method of checking a box on a decision card, and all is good. Done. That's not discipleship. It's irresponsible in our opinion. And we, by the way, have been evangelists for many years, having held altar calls thousands of times. So we know of which we speak. That is against the words of Messiah, and we'll show you. Now this is the salvation scripture, and there is none which can disagree with the very words of Yahushua himself. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Now he's talking there about false prophets. You don't know them by their resume. False prophets have great resumes. Oh, very good resumes. The best, in fact. But you'll know them by their fruits. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Wait a minute, you have to do something? Oh uh, yeah, that's what he says. Faith without works is what? Dead. No, it is a free gift, but it doesn't mean you just sit on your laurels and never do anything in order to maintain. You know, that's the fallacy. But listen to what he says. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, 
ye that work iniquity. Ouch. Think about this for a second. Who casts out demons, prophesies, and performs miracles in the church, especially today? Those are high-level functions, aren't they? Now, they should be signs that follow all of us. But they're not the focus and the purpose. And they're not salvation. Wait, some who are performing at that level will demand entrance, but be turned away from the kingdom of heaven even? That's what he says, because he never knew them. Did he say, well, they had a sin that held them back? No, he never knew them. Did he say, well, they backslid? No, he said, he never knew them. What must I do to be saved then? Many ask. You must enter a serious progressing relationship with him, period. One who backslides never had such a relationship, period. One who checks a decision card never had such a relationship if they walk away from that so-called decision. They never made the commitment in the first place. And believe me, we have been through that thousands of times of following up with people only to find out they never went to church or they went to church and they didn't get a good reception or they didn't fit in or, you know, there's lots of reasons. The point is this. You didn't give them relationship. You gave them a decision card and a checkbox. That's not discipleship. And we reject that. So, there are those that don't like that about us, and that's okay. You don't have to like that about us. Our teachings are very deep, though. And no, we don't focus on salve, the salvation message of Billy Graham because we actually reject the Billy Graham doctrine. We don't practice it anymore. We did thousands of times, trust me, but we don't do it anymore because we don't agree that that's what Scripture says. Messiah lays out salvation as a progressing relationship with him. And if we're not progressing with him, what do you think that means? I mean, you know if you're saved because you know if you are progressing in your relationship with him. You don't ever have to ask. Now, I know some have been told, well, you know, it's once saved, always saved. Well, that doctrine is also a twisting of the verse, which says nothing can separate us from the love of Yahusha. That is true. Nothing can separate us from his love. But go back again to what he is saying, because it can't disagree with what he's saying here. It must complement it, and it does. Even high-level Christians, we all need to awaken, because if he doesn't know us, we have nothing. If we don't know him, we have nothing. Especially in this age, we must know Him, and it sure helps in a progressing relationship to get to know Him more intimately, including knowing His real name, where it came from, and why we use it, not replacements meant to deceive, more than likely. You can do this. He wants relationship with you. This is not about joining an organization, and we are not setting up one. We don't ask you to join anything, and we don't even ask you for money, nothing. We just ask you to watch, test, and see if you agree. That's pretty much what we say in every video, over and over. It's about his ecclesia, which is simply a gathering. Look at the ancient definition of that word. It didn't include church. The word church is not in the Bible. And the concept of modern church is not ecclesia. It can qualify as ecclesia. We wouldn't argue with that. But it is not the true definition of ecclesia. Why? Because Yahushua defined ecclesia. He defined gatherings. He said, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. Allow him to really speak to you. 
until we started increasing our level of intimacy with Yahusha, we thought as we always did. We volunteered, we gave, we performed in just about every level of ministry imaginable. And I mean every, but we did not know him. Were we not saved? Well, we weren't progressing in our relationship because we were spending all of our time giving, giving, giving to a building, to an organization, and not to Him directly. I have been a Christian myself since I was five. I entered the ministry at age 12, but I didn't know Him. Now, I do. And it is our prayer that all of you will throw your time and effort into knowing Him above all. We're not saying don't go to church. That's not even on our radar. We're not about church. We don't talk about either way. Because to us, it's about relationship first and foremost. Priorities are what matters. And we need to prepare for these last days that we are in. You may look out the window and see peace and safety, but what does the Bible say? Sudden destruction is coming. Yahusha said that himself, and we all better be prepared. We cannot stress this enough. How do you prepare? Well, there's lots of people that will then go into, well, you know, here are these prophecies, now uh, buy our Preparation stuff, we don't do that kind of stuff here. We're talking about being prepared in true relationship with Him, that you're building, truly building your foundation on the solid rock, because that's all that matters. We cannot stress this enough. He goes on, by the way, to compare those who do. Yes, he uses the word do. Be you doers of the word, not hearers only, right? as building their foundation on the solid rock, which, by the way, is him, not Peter. That's another video we will create at one point, because the rock in Scripture is always the Messiah. It is never Peter. That is a twist. And yes, he says, do. Yes, action is required. Faith without works is dead. Oh, wait, I thought we were saved by grace, not works. Yes, you are saved by grace, but you better get off your duff and do something to deepening your relationship with him. Because that does matter. Think about it. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. You would never tell your child, well, you know, just do what you can to get by. Maybe there's some who do, but a good parent would never say that to their child. They'd always say, work hard, apply yourself, be all that you can be, right? You were saved by grace, not works, indeed. But you continue in your walk, your race, as the Bible puts it. Paul says, desiring the pure milk of the word, no longer as a child thinking and acting and functioning in just elementary things. This is why we don't preach salvation, yet we actually do. Everything we cover is about salvation, because your salvation is your engagement in relationship with Him. The Word is full of nomenclature that expresses an action to your faith and progressing with Him. Then you know Him, and you know you know Him. But if you choose to doeth not, in Matthew 7, He likens you to a house built on sinking sand, which will flounder with the changing wind and tides. We don't want to see that for you. You don't have to put up with that. That, by the way, is the best description of modern Christianity we have ever seen. It's about relationship, not religion. And that's why we don't teach Christianity. We teach the Bible and relationship. We hope you choose this narrow path. 
His name is Yahusha. And now you know, and no one and nothing can take that away from you. Thank you for watching the Name of God series. Please share this video with others and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to click the bell and view our website at thegodculture.com. Always remember to prove all things for yourself. Yahuwah God bless.